training throughout this journey, um, as well the same to my other community members, David Wilkins and Nancy Glenn. Um, so today um, we're going to be talking about climate, climate change, agriculture, and viticulture, uh, which is the growing of grapes uh, to be used to produce wine. Uh, and we're going to be kind of examining these, examining these through descriptive and predictive methods. So with that, uh, we'll get started. So broadly speaking, climate change uh, has, has very negative effects on agriculture. Um, the, the figure here on the right is a meta study by Shalinor, that's all. Um, that really just shows that global food supply and global yields of a variety of different crops are expected to decrease significantly according to some global, global climate uh, projections. And so this is a study of over a thousand different studies. You see the majority um, of these studies certainly fall into the reduction of yield categories. Um, that being said, there are, you know, more than a handful of situations where we're seeing some benefits or some increases uh, in yield here. And this could be an example of, um, you know, climate adaptation, right? Finding, a, finding a, a way to agriculturally adapt to a changing climate, which might include uh, changing to different crops or different um, cultivars of certain crops or even changing um, localities as to where we um, where we grow things at so you know in general you know agriculture is having a you know a tremendous negative effect um, however there are some some local perhaps benefits and Idaho viticulture might be one example of that so when we look at ad Idaho ag and viticulture specifically it's obviously why is it important it's a, a huge part of our economy um, it accounts for 20% of our total economic output when combined with food processing, uh, 26 plus billion dollars in annual revenue, and we've got almost 12 million acres currently planted of, of total ag. Um, when you look at the viticulture subsection, we're, we're definitely talking a much smaller subsection of that with only 1,300 acres currently planted. That being said, it's, uh, it's still having a, a pretty large economic impact um, with $210 million of impacts uh, approximately per year. Um, and perhaps most importantly of all, this subsector of ag agriculture is increasing incredibly quickly. Um, in fact, it's increased 300% in approximately the last decade. Uh, a main reason for this major um, uh, increase was the establishment of the Snake River Valley American Viticultural Area, or an AVA, um, as you can see here in the, on the slide on the right. Uh, the AVA is, um, in general, an AVA is just a geographical bounded location. It's, uh, it's really designed to kind of feature certain characteristics or attributes of the climate or the soil um, that can kind of impart some different uh, characteristics to the actual fruit or the wine itself, right? And so this is kind of mutually beneficial for both growers and consumers as well. Um, and so uh, it's elevation bounded at 1,050 meters. Um, so uh, the highest elevation is on the outside and it kind of flows down um, the valley into the this, this Snake River, as you can see, kind of cutting through the middle. And lastly, there's a point there, that red box in the middle is uh, a reference to the Sunny Slope wine districts where the majority of uh, Sunny Slope or the vineyards are located at. So I think it's, it's probably helpful to, to talk about uh, climate, the differences between climate and weather through an agricultural kind of lens. Um, so when we talk about climate, we're really talking about the general agricultural suitability, right? These basic agricultural requirements like mean temperature, precipitation, uh, total humidity, or even just the general seasonal kind of structure. And, and these are kind of determined on these long-term means, right, or seasonal means. Uh, weather, on the other hand, is all about general agricultural risk. These are all short-term events on uh, things like heat waves and convective uh, effects like flash flooding and hailstorms. Uh, and then, of course, major cold fronts and um, and freezing events, which are one of the main categories um, of, or main threats to viticulture. So when we take one of these particular uh, requirements, such as temperature in the middle there, we can really view it as a summation um, of both of these events, right? We got this T-bar or T-mean, which is really just representing the general suitability and then in kind of the long-term averages, you know, plus this, this weather event, this T-prime event, right? Which can be um, any of the things we, we just talked about. And so we were kind of looking for some data and some analysis that can get at describing both of these, right? So we're not only interested in in the T-bar over a, a long period of time, but we're also interested in how that T-bar is changing through time 
um, or the T mean is changing. And then as far as T prime or weather, we're kind of interested in, in the frequency, magnitude, and duration of short-term events and how those are going to change through time. So one way to do that was, was through a very large um, weather and climate simulation. Um, we did a 30-year Simulator was actually a 30 year simulation that was done with the LEAF group, um, Leo Flores, Caitlin Fitzgerald, and Matt Mazarek back in 2017, uh, performed through a regional climate model called WARF or the Weather and Research Forecasting Model. Um, the picture on the right is a full extent, uh, domain extent. So the outer boundary is uh, the majority of the Pacific Northwest, and all we have data there um, at a three kilometer resolution. Um, the inner box or rectangle um, is a one kilometer resolution and that's what we're going to be focusing on the the ava that we we see there outlined is is more or less entirely contained in that inner region so we have ultimately you know, 30 years of one data and this is all at hourly resolution and we have a variety of variables so this is going to be helpful in both you know for us to to describe changes in both weather and climate uh events so kind of a roadmap going forward. Part one um, is really just about answering the general question is how has climate uh, with respect to agriculture changed in the AVA over the last 30 years? And we're gonna be looking at that through a lens of four different kind of recurring themes. Uh, the novelties of high resolution data. So what can this high res data uh, do for us that uh, other climate data cannot? Um, what's the climatic influence of the, um, the structure and the geology of the valley? Uh, what are the statistical trends uh, through time? And then we're going to identify some low frequency signals that are clearly present in these, um, in these 30 years. Uh, so that leads into question two, which is really about can we leverage the relationships we find um, with these low frequency signals and large scale climate um, into a data driven climate forecast? Uh, and to do so, we're going to be using a signal processing tool called empirical mode decomposition to take some large scale data and then feed it into then an LSTM neural network to forecast temperature trends with up to lead times of one year. So let's we'll kind of start with this first question here. I first wanted to talk about local warming. Um, this is kind of just our, our mean uh, a total change over the last 30 years. So um, the ABA as a whole has changed about 0.72 degrees uh, Celsius. This is pretty on par with most uh, you know, global estimates, um, not, not significantly different in any regard. Uh, we do see pretty big differences uh, between maximum and minimum where the max is raising significantly faster than the minimum day temperatures that is. Um, and that's actually, opposite compared to most global estimates where the minimums in most places are rising faster than the maximum. So kind of interesting there. We also see a, a wide difference in the minimums changing in the upper compared to the lower part of the valley. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and next, I just kind of wanted to, to point out, we have this change in temperature is um, uniform throughout the season, right? So we, we see significant um, significantly more warming in the summertime. In fact, July alone is at 0 0.07 degrees per year, which is actually over two degrees Celsius just for that month. Um, and then we see much cooler or significantly less warming uh, in the springtime. And April, in fact, is actually the only month that is actually cooling. So uh, just important to know that this is not a uniform, um, it's not changing in a uniform fashion. So this kind of begs the question, well, temperature, what are the effects um, or, or, um, of temperature you know, on agriculture and, and viticulture specifically? So the first thing we want to talk about is growing degree days. Um, this is a very common tool for, for farmers to be able to really just get a heuristic measure of the crop phenology. So like the timing of the life cycle of it. Um, it's helpful to predict, you know, that you need a certain amount of heat for, you know, for bud burst or, you know, to eventually get to it to a harvest of fruit. Um, so it's really just a sum of, of heat, which we kind of measure through temperature. Um, and we use a base temperature um, that more or less says, you know, any temperature beneath this, you're not going to get any valuable type of growth out of. Right, so you're only going to get any sort of valuable growth when the temperature is at least above the base. So we're taking the difference between those two and summing it up over the growing season. Uh, and the T base for, for grapes happens to be about uh, 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Uh, other temperature effects are the extreme temperatures, you know, of, of weather that we talked about, and this includes timing, uh, the, the magnitude of these extremes and the durations of how long they last. And then a more indirect uh, impact is fungal pathogens, right? If we have extended kind of conditions that are conductive to or conducive to uh, certain pathogens, um, such as powdery mildew. So we'll talk about that later as well. So when we talk about growing degree days, there's, there's the one kind of main classic method that's used to calculate it. And it's really just used to calculate it by, by taking the mean temperature, you're calculating growing degree days on, on a daily basis, and you're estimating the mean by taking the minimum daily temperature and the maximum daily temperature and just averaging that and then subtracting that from the base. Well, it turns out that that is not always a great approximation, um, especially if you have some, some different kind of topography like we have here, where we actually err on more close to the minimum temperature than we do the max. So one kind of benefit of this high-res data is that we can actually just take all of our hourly 24 observations, take the mean of all those, and then subtract that from the, or I'm sorry, subtract the base temperature from that. And as you see, you get significantly different results with the traditional method grossly overestimating the total GDD in the valley. So this can very clearly kind of uh, impact some, maybe some management decisions or something um, where we're not really getting an accurate reflection of, of the actual GDD in the valley. Um, you've got differences of upwards of almost 15% of the total value when um, changing it to a 24-hour a method. So kind of speaking, coming back to this idea of the valley and, and this the topographic kind of profile of it, um, here we're looking at scatter plots of the total elevation within the area on the y-axis versus temperature on the x-axis. Um, we've got maximums on the left, so if we focus on that one first, we see a, a very strong correlation and, and a pretty standard atmospheric profile, right? So the higher you go up in altitude, the colder it gets, um, which is very, very common. So that is the standard kind of atmospheric profile. Um, now, when we look at daily minimum temperatures, we do not see that standard profile at all. Um, you actually see, if you, if you look at the, the 600, the 800, the low elevation areas, you get a huge shift of all those getting much, much colder temperatures and where those are not the, the highest of the minimums. Um, and this is strictly due to kind of like the inversion effects um, where of the, the topography of our valley where you have cool air, which is denser than warm air. Um, as soon as you get radiation that ceases for the day and goes beyond the horizon, all of a sudden now you get that, that colder air up top wanting to sink down uh, and kind of displace the, the warmer air below. Um, and so this has pretty important uh, ramifications for uh, agriculture and viticulture as far as frost and everything goes. And, um, so when we look at um, some of the, the extremes of this happening, um, the plots here are the number of days that certain location or that any location has experienced uh, any temperature that drops below a certain threshold. So if we look at this, this plot in the, the upper left-hand corner, we actually see that there's you know, a handful of days where temperatures got to below negative 35 degrees Celsius. This is super, super dangerous temperatures uh, for agriculture. Uh, we had one such event in January of 2017 that wiped out a lot of vineyards um, that they actually had to replant a bunch of their vines. And this can have major effects is it takes another two to three years after planting to actually produce useful fruit from them. Um, so, you know, the key takeaway here is that these risky, dangerously cold temperatures are happening at the lower elevations as a result of this atmospheric profile or the, as a result of the, the topography we have in this cold air coming in, cold air pooling sinking in. Um, it's also worth, I think, noting that this happens at a very small local scale as well. So at the vineyard scale as well, you get these, these pooling effects. So next, let's talk about a method in an index called frost degree days that's useful to better constrain the magnitude and duration of freezing events. Um, the equation for this is similar in, in a sense to, to GDD that we're just kind of using a, a reference temperature now of zero degrees Celsius. And so we're saying if any temperature is above zero degrees at any time step, we're just going to mark that as a zero. Um, and then for every degree that you're below zero degrees Celsius for every time step, you're just going to mark that as the difference between zero and that, uh, 
and that temperature, which is the same as the absolute value of that temperature at that point. And so for example, if you had, if it was negative 10 degrees outside uh, the entire day for 24 hours, you would have negative 10 times 24, so you'd have a total of 240 frost degrees that day, which kind of you know helps constrain the magnitude and duration of these events. So to to further kind of expand on this, we can see the impact of this by looking at the left plot, which is really just a difference now of just the sheer amount of time that we've spent below freezing, right? Just frost hours, total number of hours that were below zero. Um, and when you map that out, you know, a difference of the first 15 years versus the last 15 years, um, you see that it's all negative, right? So we're, you know, probably as, as expected, we're warming enough to where we're spending less and less time under freezing conditions. Um, however, when you look at the difference in frost degree days, you get this area kind of almost near um, Boise, Caldwell, Nampa, Sunny Slope, kind of the, the Snake River Valley in this, this upper basin up here, um, or lower basin, you have a lot of positive values here. Um, so this is saying, despite the fact that you're spending less time uh, being freezing, the, the magnitude of them are worse, right? So when it does get cold, it's getting really cold, right? And so this could definitely have some major effects of, of different farms kind of in this area, right? And to see if this is a trend that maybe long-term inversion patterns um, are perhaps uh, more prone in this area than in other parts of the ABA. So next let's talk about, you know, continue talking about the, the timing of this frost. Uh, in, the, in the top plot here, we've got in the blue, you've got our spring frost dates, you know, when you get the last frost of spring. Um, and then in the orange, you've got the fall um, represented by the first frost of the year. And the main takeaway of this big one up top here is that there's, there's a lot of heterogeneity. There's, you know, again, just representative of the huge amounts of topographical variance and kind of interannual variance as to when these events can actually happen. Um, and so uh, you have a lot of different areas that are experiencing totally different, you know, on the, the order of multiple weeks of difference timing of when you're actually experiencing frost. Um, when we look at the bottom plot here, now we're saying when we look at the standard deviation of when these events happen in time, you find, again, blues in spring, you find that the mean happens, you know, within about a two week period of the same day of year. However, it's a much wider distribution. And this is evidence saying that the spring events are much more likely to be localized and um, you, you can experience more kind of convective type stuff and just weather that, that's more localized. Whereas in the fall, even though you have a higher mean of 20 different, you know, or 20 days on average of when you're going to experience that frost, you have a super narrow distribution, which is really just saying that whenever, whenever it comes and gets cold and we're going to get it, it's going to sweep through the whole ABA. It all changes as a whole in the fall and we have a lot more variety uh, and risk in the spring. So when we kind of start to look at trends of this frost timing, um, we ultimately see that the growing season is, is lengthening, but it's also shifting forward. So it looks like both the average, you know, over the last 30 years, the average spring dates is actually, frost day is actually moving forward a couple of days in time. Um, and then fall is actually moving significantly forward in time. And ultimately we end up with about an eight day um, increase in the total growing season, which is really just a, uh, Growing seasons defined as you know first frost to last frost um, traditionally, um, and so yeah, so, so we're seeing some some ultimate shifts there that could you know maybe challenge some of the traditional kind of planting days of the year, right? If we see this these trends continue. So next, I kind of want to you know overlay on this and kind of maybe you've noticed this already, but many of these plots kind of seem to have an, you know a low frequency signal involved, and and these plots are no exception to that. Um, you know, when you when you look at these two signals, you can you can tell immediately that they co-vary to get negatively co-vary to with each other very well. Um, and so, th this is interesting. It's really saying that okay, like they're both being affected by the same thing, even though these two events are six months apart. We have something that has you know a time frame of more than six months that's kind of driving some of this stuff. So, it's actually you know in a sense we can say if we have a later first frost in, or sorry, last frost in the spring, if that's later in time, we are more likely then to have an earlier fall frost as well, because we have, you know, a bigger, large scale, you know, thing dominating 
the weather and kind of driving that. So, you know, additional evidence of these low frequency signals. Um, if we look at the top here, um, on the left is just a spaghetti plot of GDD, just showing that there's relatively a small amount of respective uh, interannual variance. Um, and then when we plot that out through time on the right, there's a clear, um, again, a clear signal through there um, that seems to be operating on this variance. On the bottom, we just have now precipitation. So you see with the spaghetti plot, you see much wider range in, in variance of this, but yet you also still see a, a large uh, overriding low frequency signal kind of driving this. Um, you might be able to make the argument that these two are also negatively covariant together, um, although I do not think it is as clear as other metrics. So in a sense, I think we can say that you know, you might be able to, to infer that if there's some large scale things that are driving one thing, it doesn't, it doesn't mean the precipitation and temperature and everything's being driven by the exact same mechanism. There might be different mechanisms driving different kind of changes in different variables. Um, so let's next kind of talk about anomalous temperatures. Um, again, we've got kind of a, a seasonal distribution of um, here we're looking at above uh, daily events that happen above the 99th percentile of that day of the year. Um, and I think I'm, I'm going to just have everyone more or less focus on the bottom left plot here. So when, again, when we, when we look at this through time, we see some, some interesting things here that not only are we seeing a linear increase in the frequency of these anomalous events, but we're also seeing a very clear another low frequency signal kind of oscillating between this. And I think the importance of this is saying that not only are these large scale signals kind of driving the, the T bar or the T mean, you know, kind of component of this, but it's also driving the, the risk too. It's also driving the T prime, right? These anomalous events as well, which is pretty interesting. So last, I, I kind of want to mention talking about powdery mildew is our last uh, metric here. Um, this is another example of being able to use really um, uh, hourly data and kind of high resolution data where it's actually required. This risk index was developed by uh, UC Davis and it's a fairly involved algorithm that involves uh, monitoring hourly temperature for you know like six eight hours a day and to, to see if a temperature stays within a particular threshold for that and then the seeing of that event happens for multiple days in a row. And if so, then you have some, you know, conditions to kind of raise and lower the index. Um, but as far as we know, you know, this was an example of how to utilize that, that hourly data. And I think we were the, as far as I know, the first to map out regional powdery mildew index at this, uh, at this resolution. Um, and so, you know, it's obviously important because treating it with copper sulfide is quite expensive. Um, it's also pretty interesting that there's a lot of again, heterogeneity throughout the whole valley here, and, and specifically in that kind of sunny slope region, you see a lot of variance in that particular region. So let's, let's talk about briefly some, some linear trends here. Um, I'm not gonna go through, go through all of these, but um, ultimately what we're seeing is, as we've already described, that temperatures are going up, GDD is going up significantly. In fact, GDD here, we have going up linearly at about 130, uh, growing degree days Celsius of total change over the 30 years. Um, that's actually more than the actual overall standard deviation. So it's actually a, you know, we, we've, you know, compared to 30 years ago, we've more than made up for the annual various variation that existed back then, you know, by 106%. So I think that's pretty cool and can obviously open up pathways to uh, growing different varietals and um, doing a, you know, doing more than we could do 30 years ago. Uh, season length is increasing, the frost metrics are decreasing, uh, PMI, the powdery mildew is increasing. Um, but really what I next kind of want to talk about is these p-values here that you might have talked about. And we do not have kind of traditionally low p-values that they are often used to measure significance by this one, five or 10% um, level. And so, you know, in a sense, I think we can say that, well, maybe p-values aren't the best metric to to look at this data, um, A, because we know we've identified that there's a low frequency signal in there accounting for a lot of interannual variance. Um, B, we're only using 30 data points. So if we had you know, climate data for 100 years, there's a good chance that a lot of this stuff could become significant using this. Um, but you know, as, a, as a response to this, we, we ran 
tests. Namely, we ran the, the KS and the Man Whitney tests. Um, the stats are not specifically shown here, but uh, what we did was we took 15 year splits of these two uh, distributions, right? The, the spatial um, distributions of the first 15 years and the second 15 years, and we ran single tail tests, you know, trying to determine what we would expect, um, if, you know, GDD is going to increase, et cetera. And all of these metrics came back as coming from significantly different distributions. So in a sense, what this tells us is, is that, yeah, p-value might not be the, you know, the, the best accurate in that, you know, our trends that we've identified here, because they do come from different, different distributions, we can still find value in them and still find them to be useful. So the key takeaways of part one, uh, we've got high resolution climate data allows us to drive novel agrometrics, uh, improve methodologies for calculating growing degree days and better represent uh, the site suitability. Uh, most trends are in most metric trends are beneficial to viticulture, including uh, the increased growing season, substantial increase of GDD uh, and reduced frequency of freezing temperatures. Uh, the asterisk there being that well, we're seeing reduced frequency, but the magnitude could be increasing in some areas. And then we identify clear low frequency signals um, that are present in many agrometrics. So next, I kind of want to real quick just uh, highlight um, a web app that I developed. Part of this project was funded by the Idaho State Department of Agriculture. And so part of the deliverable was to, to give them a web app to for stakeholders and farmers alike to be able to examine a lot of this data that we're talking about. So here's an example of, of being able to map historical data or anomalous data through the last 30 years. And you can zoom in and look at all the data at a, uh, the one kilometer grid cell uh, location. Uh, next, there's a time series analysis, which allows you to kind of pick some, uh, some metrics and, and compare individual years with each other. Kind of zoom in and look at all the values on a day by day basis. Statistics tab kind of provides some bulk statistics on a year by year basis of the AVA as a whole, either by year, by month, or by day. And then the, there's a download data section, which really is a, is a point and click and allows you to select any longitude or latitude within the, within the, re, uh, the region there, and then view, uh, view an annual report, which is just a year by year report, or a statistical summary, and then with the click of a button, you can download this, this full report at any specific location um, in this area. So I think it's a, a pretty nifty tool that, uh, that can be used to, to help, uh, yeah, just help provide uh, climate information uh, to, to whoever needs it. So next, let's go on to, to kind of part two um, of this talk, we're gonna talk about large-scale climate and teleconnections. Um, most people are familiar with the teleconnection of El Nino, which is definitely the most common and widely studied of the phenomenon. Uh, a teleconnection is kind of broadly defined as a, an anomalous climate anomalies separated by very large distances um, and usually measured by sea surface temperature or SST and then sea level pressure or SLP. Um, they, if you look at this, this picture on the left here is really just is showing upper atmospheric winds um, kind of circulating around the globe. And you can see, just like any sort of energy, it travels in a wave-like format. Um, on Earth, or when you have a rotating fluid, it's specifically, it's called a Rossby wave. And so these Rossby waves kind of exist in this wave-like format in both the atmosphere and the ocean as well. However, the waves, uh, the, the Rossby waves in the ocean move at much slower speeds. So as a result, in general, of, of, of just the, the, the orbit, orbit and the spinning of the, the Earth, we kind of end up with some semi-permanent climate systems um, like the Aleutian Low, the Icelandic Low, Azores High, the Polar Vortex. Um, perhaps some people have kind of heard of these things. Um, and it's really this interplay of the, the oceanic and the atmospheric Rossby waves that then def define and change these teleconnections at different locations that we can then look at how they differ from one another and kind of describe the climate um, in general. So we're going to be looking at two of these specifically. The first one we'll look at is, is ENSO, or the, the atmospheric component of ENSO, um, which is really the difference between SST and uh, sea level pressure between Australia and Tahiti. And then we're also going to look at uh, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation being a difference in sea surface temperature in, uh, in, the, more or less in, the, in the tropical and the, the mid-latitudes of the Pacific Ocean. You can see that there's um, 
it varies much more slowly in the Pacific decadal side, um, whereas the, um, the ENSO varies uh, at a much quicker rate. You can also see that they're both noisy signals with all the, um, if you took the raw signal alone, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So when you have correlations between the AVA and general teleconnections, there's lots of these established. Um, lots of people have heard, you know, oh, we're gonna have a bad winter because of El Nino or et cetera. Um, this is an example of the T mean anomaly is the color in the Snake River Valley AVA. Um, and when you look at the, the upper left-hand quadrant, when PDO is high and SOI is low, that's when we're likely to have really warm temperatures out here in the valley. Uh, the opposite is true when you have high SOI and, uh, and low PDO. However, um, despite the fact that these relationships certainly exist at this standpoint, you can tell that it's a very noisy distribution and this will pose problems from, you know, from a modeling perspective. So our first kind of crack at this was to try, you know, using, utilizing a long short-term memory network or an LSTM. It's a specific type of recurrence neural network that we'll talk about. Uh, it gained popularity in the natural language processing field uh, and is also gaining popularity in time series that is specifically hydrological data and, and snowmelt modeling. Um, whereas prior information, you know, from, from the seasonal snowpack is very useful, you know, to predict future stream melt, for example. So, you know, looking at these kind of ugly spider diagrams, um, really all I want you to get out of this is that when we look at A, which is the, the typical neural network, you don't have any information being passed along the, the hidden layers in gray in between. Each time step is kind of independent of, of one another. In an RNN structure, you actually are passing now useful information from previous time steps to newer time steps, um, which is gonna be really useful um, when modeling time series. Um, and then LSTMs actually have this third kind of, you know, additional pass, which is really just uh, a way of retaining information for longer periods of time. In the RNN structure, there's something called a vanishing gradients where the weights of doing this will rapidly diminish and it can only remember information of a, of a couple of time steps uh, previous to that, whereas an LSTM can hold on to them for as long as you would like. So a very kind of brief description of this LSTM state. Um, what I want you to get out of here is that it's really controlled by three specific gates, uh, a forget gate, an input gate, and an output gate. This forget gate is probably almost the most important one, and this one is just kind of a binary switch that's really just saying, you know, was the information that's, that was passed from the previous time signal, is that important? Do we want to keep it or not? You know, and you can do this for an, an infinite amount of time signals in the past, right, if you continue to keep it um, and, and inform your model with these past decisions. Uh, the input one is just saying, do we want to keep the, the current information? How useful is that? And then the output is what you're just sending to the next time step. So um, if you look at up in the purple at the top, what you end up with is every feature now is an actual sequence of time. It's not just one time step being a feature to predict something else. You have a whole sequence of data that's considered one feature to produce a result at one time step. So as, a, as an example to this, consider this sentence. I lived in France as a teenager where I studied the language and became fluent in blank. As a, as a human, we have pretty good memory persistence and it's pretty easy to, to understand that that word should be French. Um, and that's because our memory can, can persist back to the fact that we, we see and remember that, that France was given, which that was actually given 13 words or 13 time steps ahead of that um, and that word was almost solely, solely implied by that. Maybe language, um, which is five steps back, kind of implies that as well. Um, but ultimately, you have to get back that far to get the correct answer. Most statistical models um, do not have, you know, this kind of memory. And so this is the intuitive nature of, uh, of LSTMs as is passing this useful information through time. So now for us, instead of words, we're just using a time series signal and keeping, you know, multiple time steps and a chunk of a sequence to be used as a feature. So our first attempt was just using the raw teleconnection data specifically as input to an LSTM, and it performed quite poorly. Um, this could be due just to the amount of noise um, in those signals. So we tried to decompose these signals and we used a uh, empirical mode decomposition method, which is a signal processing tool um, to, to separate the signals into single frequency time series. So it preserves the time aspect of that. Uh, and it's suitable for non-stationary and non-linear data, similar to, to climate data. 
So the overall process of this uh, sifting process, I'm not gonna go through this uh, in detail, but the, the general idea behind this is, is that you take you know, an original signal and then you take the, the lower and the upper envelopes of the signal or the local and minima, local and minima and um, maxima and kind of connect those. And then when you take a mean of the difference of those and the actual signal alone, you end up with this, what they call an IMF, uh, an intrinsic mode function. And so you do that and you iterate over and over again um, to, to come up with a complete signal um, that the, uh, the summation of all these individual IMFs will complete the full signal. And so what this looks like in real, um, is you have these very noisy uh, PDO and SOI signals on the left, just the raw data. When you transform that with an EMD decomposition, you see um, various frequencies of different signals here. And you can see, despite they're being pretty, pretty related, they're, they're kind of negatively, um, again, covariant here, but they're, they're quite related, you get very different looking IMFs here, right? And so the idea with this is to kind of tease out maybe some of the frequencies, which ones are more important than other ones, right? Which, um, which climate processes within this are really driving kind of differences in, in regional climate. So we're using, we had nine IMFs a piece that were produced. So now instead of two features to our LSTM, we're gonna use all of these. And we're gonna now have 18 time series to feed in as our, input data for our LSTM. So next we'll just kind of talk about the, the Y components of, of what we're predicting. Um, of course we're predicting just temperature in the Snake River Valley ABA, um, but to, to kind of simplify this process we wanted to um, just take the trend component and so with this we did that with uh, additive decomposition. So we just removed the seasonal signal and the, the noise and we just are left with this moving average trend of the signal and so that's going to be our, our y variable. So again, the full conceptual framework here is that we have x being this, this teleconnection, um, large scale signal data that we're going to run through an empirical mode decomposition algorithm to end up with multiple now intrinsic mode functions. And then we're feeding those um, as, as certain sequent links of those into the LSTM as features to predict the y data, which is regionally aggregated climate data, it's then decomposed in this additive uh, decomposition, remove any further linear trend and scale it. So the overall framework and methodology here is that we end up choosing a sequence length of six months to use for, um, for our data. And so, so again, this is six months of data that has been used to produce one, um, one time step observation or forecast. Um, we ran our model for a total of, of 40 lagged lead time forecast from one month in advance up to 12 months or one year in advance. And we chose to train and validate um, using two different, um, two different periods. Um, and we did this um, with the limited data that we have. We found this to be a, a more effective way of utilizing the most training data we could. So we, in the first case, we trained on 94 to 2017 and then just trained on the, or I'm sorry, tested on the first six years. And then in the latter example, we train on the first 24 years and then test on the last six. And then we run an ensemble approach to this, uh, which is a mean of eight different uh, specific runs. And so the results of this uh, indicate that, well, I guess to, to explain this plot, um, the, the right-hand side is kind of a, a more boring signal. That was the six years of trend data um, at the end of, um, yeah, in the, in the last six years. Um, so I'll this more and probably the more interesting signal, which is this left column. Uh, from top to bottom, we see lead times of one month. The bottom column is a lead time of 12 months. And we actually find that throughout, throughout most of these, we find a, a very good um, adherence to the pattern of climate data just using uh, the IMFs of this uh, large scale data um, with lead times up to a full year. It's still accurately predicting uh, the pattern quite well. Um, so the, the, the key takeaways here are that many agricultural uh, metrics are loosely correlated with large scale climate phenomenon. Uh, decomposing the large scale signals now with an EMD as input to an LSTM uh, significantly improves uh, the modeling power of, of such a framework. 
and that farmers can, uh, can potentially benefit uh, directly with forecasts and forming conditions that might guide such you know, decisions such as irrigation or spray timing, um, et cetera. So with that, I, uh, I would like to thank so many people. Um, thank you so much to my committee, Leho, David, and Nancy. Um, I'd like to give a special shout out to Dave's uh, viticulture course um, that he teaches normally in the fall. I'm not sure if he's teaching it this year, but I, I highly recommend that, that field campaign. Um, I'd like to thank a lot of, you know, all of the past and present members of both lab groups, the LEAF and BCAL lab group, specifically uh, Kendra, Caroline, uh, Will, and, uh, and Matt Masaryk. Um, thank you so much for all of your mentorship. I'd like to thank Gus and, and Scott uh, Dukar specifically, um, just for all of your help. Thank you to, to all of my friends, to my family, to my brother Nick, um, and uh, perhaps most importantly, it's my wonderful girlfriend, Jenna. Um, just thank you all for, for your support. This has been an awesome, awesome journey for me. So with that, I am happy to uh, field any questions you have. Thanks so much. All right, thank you, Charlie. I will um, unmute everybody for just a second so that they can applaud. This says from me to everyone. I did not type anything. All right. No. Someone. Okay. Um. So um. Let's see. I'm going to unmute. Charlie's unmuted. Um. So if you can, please use the um, raise hand feature if you would like to ask Charlie a question. So I'm going to unmute Alex. Hey, Charlie. That was a. Uh an excellent presentation. Um, I really enjoyed that. So um, I had a question about the um, recurrent, and uh, the, the short-term whatever recurrent neural network that you used. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the, what did you call it? The forget, the um, forget node or something? The gates, yeah. The, the gate, yeah, the forget gate, which basically tells you how long, as if I, understand correctly how long to go back in time mm -hmm. well, is that a is that a learned feature is that a learned so that is that is not a, a learned um feature it, it acts more as like a binary operator that you're really like is why you kind of have a combination of the different gates is the way i understand it so the like, forget one specifically is just saying you know a quick sigmoid function to determine do i was the information from the last time step useful you know, do we want to keep it yes or no right and you can do that yeah. for every single one for as much as you as you would like right and then and then i believe that the learn features then come into the the current input gate right is is how important is that is that feature at that point in time right and then you can choose to to retrieve that from the next time step if you choose so that's really interesting and i i mean I, it's a it's a super powerful idea and I wonder if there's some way that you can extract the that feature information and see to kind of see how far back in time or, or how that's, important oh so that's a yeah that's an excellent question so there's a fantastic paper that kind of demonstrates exactly what you're you're talking about um, and precisely and so it was done with hydrologic modeling and streamflow modeling um, and it was a paper that that showed that he was running sequence links of a full year of 365 days yeah. of various climate data to predict stream flow um, into the future. And he showed that the weights of the uh, of the cell states um, or the cell state, yeah, the total you know uh, metric of the cell state, you know, at each point in time through the year, actually mimics the like the snowmelt dynamics, right? Like it actually mimicked the physics of that well. So when you map that through time, it correlated really well with not just like like the lagged part of temperature, right? Like when you would actually start to see snowmelt happen. Yeah, so. yeah, that's that's interesting. I'll I'll email you to remind you because I'd like to see that paper. Um, and um, I guess the. The last kind of point is you could potentially then use that information in an iterative way to help inform you on your decomposition, you know, and which frequency bands to to look at. Totally. So I, I thought about that too. I um that is absolutely I think, yeah, like an idea almost like a 
you know, like you would use a random force or something like that by leaving some of them, them out and then, you know, determining which, which ones have the most importance. Like, right. I think there's a lot of extensions there yet to determine which frequencies matter the most. And then can you link that to specific kind of like phenomena in, in the large scale system for sure. Right. right. Physically. Oh, thank you. And again, that was a great talk. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Alex. Thanks so much. Okay. Carson has a question next. Yeah, hi. I'm going to turn on my video so you can see me asking a question. Um, nice job, Charlie. That was really awesome. Yeah, I was curious about the web app that you developed for that first part and um, how you've distributed it and provided it to the farmers and if you know how they're currently using it. Sure. So it was not, it was not widely um, widely advertised. It was kind of a process, you know, a process of going through that um, it was some word of mouth, some of it was featured in some other um, uh, conferences. I'm trying to think the Northwest Climate Conference is one uh, particular um, arena where I kind of showcased it, showcased it at. Um, and some of it's just word of mouth by working with some of the local farmers and providing them the links um, to this. Um, I have not gotten a ton of feedback on how the, the farmers themselves have been using it. Um, however, we did kind of run a, a UX study on it, uh, experience study to, to begin with um, before officially deploying it. And so we recruited a bunch of graduate and undergraduate students to, to play around with it and kind of answer a Google survey to kind of inform some uh, documentation and where, what the strengths and the weaknesses were. And so we definitely utilize that information to make it more accessible. Cool. That's awesome. I wonder if you could do any sort of like workshops at some, I mean, maybe this is totally beyond the scope of stuff, but do some workshops with um, wine growers to help them help them use it because it looks like such a cool uh, tool. So I anyway. think that's a great idea. Thanks for the yeah. suggestion. Nice job. Thanks. Okay. I think uh, Hamid had a question next. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Charlie. That was a great presentation. I really liked it. And congratulations for that. Uh, just a quick question about uh, your trend analysis. So I would like to know, like, uh, so there's a, there are a couple of papers that says there's a re relationship between short-term, long-term memory and estimation of the trend significance. I'm not sure if the, the short-term, long-term memory that I'm talking about is similar to what you presented, like LSTM concept, which I don't really understand. It's just the correlation between the time series data points with themselves, right, over the time. And that actually might affect the p-value estimation. So I was wondering, did you have the chance to explore like that or not? And follow up on that question is, so based on your experience with this data, what kind of trend, what technique do you, would you suggest for trend estimation and the significance of the trend for sure? Yeah, that's a, uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting questions in there, I guess. Um, and I, I don't know if I have the, the perfect answer for, um, you know, to, for the best way to, I mean, this is a discussion that we, me and my lab group was kind of discussing, right, of the various different methods of, of, of trend analysis and, and which, and what applications are the right ones to be used, right? And I don't think there's like a one size fits all kind of like approach and, and answer to, to fully answer that question, right? Like you could even, um, you know, especially when you have highly varying, you know, non-stationary data, I think there are some techniques that, that are better suited for that. And of course, different ones have different assumptions, you know, that it's either normally distributed or that the errors are normally distributed. Um, but in this case, you know, just using the, yeah, I mean, I, I just cho chose to use, you know, the linear kind of, you know, estimation, trend estimation, because the assumptions fit, um, and then kind of backed it up with just saying that, hey, that they do different distributions using two different types of tests, right? We use this, the, the KS test, which isn't necessarily trend estimation, you know, of course, um, but we use that along with, um, with the other test, right, which is just giving us different information about how these distributions are changing, right, which kind of backs up the fact that these trends are, are changing. But, you know, as far as kind of, uh, using more like you know non-linear methods of, of trend estimation um i'm sure there are some but i i don't know which ones would would fit this case um and do yeah. the best job so i'm not sure if i answered your question there. yeah you did yeah thank you yeah great thank you are there any more questions for charlie
Okay, it doesn't appear that there are, um, um, unless Justin, you just unmuted yourself or you, do you have a question? Yes, I, I, I have a quick one if I could. Um, Charlie, thank you very much. This was, this was fascinating to, uh, to see and to look at your methodologies. I wanted to ask um, on a fundamental level, um, are the models that you ran, are they uh, perhaps scalable or easily applicable to say other growing regions um, in and around Idaho or in and around Boise? Yeah, super, um, very scalable. So a great question. Um, LS teams are oftentimes um, can be pretty, pretty, pretty lightweight depending on how long your your actual sequences are. So, um, so a so in that regard, they they do not take uh, a ton of time to to train in this capacity. So they're definitely scalable along that. And we were only looking at kind of aggregated climate data of the of the valley there. So if you are, um, it's very easy to. Uh, to aggregate you know data anywhere else and just apply this the same methodology to it so it would be very easy i think to take this framework and, and apply it to to any region as long as you have the the aggregated climate data um, that you have and then to retrain of course on the um using the parameters right because if you get to different locations you might not have relationships with with those uh, connections so. thank you very much See, this is uh, Jen. Great job, Charlie. That was really, um, really informative um, and yeah, fantastic. Um, I guess um, I was wondering. I mean, I, I think that you um, did such a nice job, com you know, portraying the complexity of the data. Um, however, some folks might look at this data and say, "Oh, more growing degree days um, means greater agricultural yields. Um, so that must be a good thing." So, um, I guess breaking this down and, and talking about the um, implications for water availability and, and such, what would, you, what would you say if you were asked by a policymaker about that? That's a great question. Um, I mean, so, so the precipitation is, is one thing specifically, right, that I didn't talk about at all, right, that all of these, um, all of these vineyards are, are rely on irrigation and rely on the snowmelt here. And so without that, if we don't have enough water the climate in every other respect just doesn't matter, right? So, so that is a super important that we have enough water, right? And so, and there's been plenty of studies kind of showing that the variability of water with climate change is going to uh, is going to increase. And so, with that being the case, there's already more risk um, involved from that aspect alone. That's kind of you know more or less unavoidable. Um, outside of that, I would say that there are you know, it's not a long-term solution, right? Like we have enough land that we're not really like worried about like, at least currently about transforming certain lands into, into other things. I think we have enough land to kind of produce some, you know, some viticulture and some vineyards that do have these small scale like benefits of, of the GDD, right? I think it's just, it's just so important as they think that just because we can kind of adapt to this in some ways and maybe even benefit from it in some ways that this is not remotely universally beneficial, right? The, a lot of other sectors are struggling quite bad and having really negative effects of that. And so to, to kind of pick and choose, right, it might be as simple as just kind of, well, if some vineyards or some crops want to change to a different varietal or something that might be able to tolerate heat or, uh, or something like that a little bit more, then, then we can go that way. But to, to really paint the picture that it's uh, the climate change and the mitigation of that is still super important because ultimately this is, this is having negative effects. Awesome. Well, it is right at the top of the hour. And so I just wanted to finish up by, um, by thanking you all for joining us um, virtually. Um, and um, yeah, I, I will unmute one last time and let you all kind of give uh, Charlie your congratulations. Congratulations, Charlie. Okay. Charlie. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for joining me. Um, all right. Thank you all. Okay. And then to Nancy, Charlie, and um, uh, Dave, why don't we pick up on the other um, Zoom link for the private meeting um, at 410, just to let everybody kind of have a quick bio break, um, maybe get a beer or something. Um, so does that work?
Yep, that sounds good. Or sounds another great. cup of tea, Nancy. You, 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 you <laughs> me, Some more caffeine. You, you me a beer. All right. Great job, Charlie. Sounds good great. to me. Thanks so much. Looking forward to chatting about it in a couple of minutes here. Okay, great. I'll uh, I'll open that meeting in just a minute. So. Cool. Thanks. See you a bit, Charlie. Okay.